Good evening, everyone. My name is Deepak Gupta, and I'm currently a freshman from New Haven, Connecticut in the School of Foreign Service, studying science, technology, and international affairs. I'm a member of the South Asian Society, the Georgetown University Public Speaking Club, and, as you might have guessed, GU Politics. Before we start, I would like to thank the Institute of Politics and Public Service and the McCourt School of Public Policy for putting together this amazing event. I also want to thank Mr. Steyer for joining us for tonight's event, To Impeach or Not to Impeach. Mr. Steyer has often been regarded as one of the most successful investors and businessmen in America. After seeing firsthand how our economic system failed working people while helping those at the top, he left his company and began working full time to guarantee every family shares the benefits of economic opportunity, education, and a healthy climate. Mr. Steyer founded a nonprofit grassroots advocacy organization, Next Gen America, to fight for progressive outcomes on issues like climate change, healthcare, immigration, inequality, and criminal justice. Another one of Mr. Steyer's current and most notable endeavors is the Need to Impeach campaign, launched in 2017. The goal of the project is to demand that members of Congress put country ahead of party politics and hold President Trump accountable. Within just four months, it became one of the largest grassroots efforts of its kind, drawing more than five million supporters from across all 50 states. As someone from a state that has been plagued by the consequences of severe income inequality, I sincerely admire Mr. Steyer's work. In California, he preserved clean air protections by defeating a ballot measure sponsored by the oil industry to roll back renewable energy laws. Then, he secured billions of dollars in additional funding for California schools through a ballot campaign of his own, which closed a tax loophole exploited by powerful corporations. He followed that with another successful ballot effort that expanded the state's health care services by getting tobacco companies to pay their fair share of health costs through a tobacco tax increase. Through his efforts, I can be assured that communities like mine have the potential to foster better futures for everyone. Moderating tonight's event is Geopolitics Executive Director Mo Elithi. Before launching the Institute in 2015, Mo spent two decades as one of the top communication strategists, strategists in the Democratic Party, most recently as Communications Director and Chief Spokesman of the Democratic National Committee. To follow along tonight on social media, you can stay connected through the at Geopolitics channels. Thank you again to Mr. Steyer, and I'll turn it over Mo to begin the conversation. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out in the midst of midterms. I know, uh, I know how busy y'all are, and um, I just want to especially recognize an, uh, an old friend of mine, Bobby Matheson, who spent some time in the Virginia legislature and is now the current or outgoing? Current, both. Both current and outgoing U.S. Marshal from the Eastern District of Virginia. Um, and I asked him here just in case things get unruly between Tom and I tonight. <laughs> uh, Bobby's going to take care of it. Um, so this has been a hell of a few days, right, in terms of news um, and the Mueller investigation and how people are thinking about um, Donald Trump and how those who want to see a new president approach Donald Trump. Um, I promise you that this event had been scheduled before the, uh, the bar letter. I won't say the Mueller report's out, but the bar letter about the Mueller report came out. Um, and so it's very fortuitous. And so, Tom, I want to thank you so much for, for being here with us tonight. Before we dive into the, the, the heart of the, the conversation tonight, which will be about the case for impeachment from your perspective, um, and I'm sure we'll talk about a few other things, I actually kind of want to talk starting about you. You've been very fortunate in, in your life and worked hard and amassed um, a, bit of, uh, a bit of wealth that you've decided to sort of reinvest in advocacy, philanthropy and advocacy, launching several major organizations, including Next Gen Action, which focuses on uh, educating and organizing people around climate change and uh, Need to Impeach, which I think is a fairly self-explanatory title. Uh, there was also some talk that you might uh, have thrown your hat into the ring for the White House. Um, in 2020, which you ultimately opted not to do. I guess I want to just, what compelled you 
to get involved in advocacy and why that route rather than elected office? So um, I don't know if you guys know anything about me whatsoever, um, but I would have to say that in many ways, I'm one of the luckiest people in the world. And part of that is having very supportive parents who put me in a position to go to great schools like Georgetown. I didn't go to Georgetown, I went to Yale. But I got to great educations and they took care of me. And um, you know, for instance, I never wondered if I was gonna have a hot meal at night. I might argue with my mother about her cooking, but we knew we were gonna be sitting down to a hot meal with the same people every single night, which not everybody gets a chance to do. And I knew I'd get a chance to go to great schools if I could get into great schools. And I knew that I'd get a chance to, you know, see what I could do, which is not true of everybody in the United States by a long shot. But also, just being born in the United States was a great gift. So I felt as if, you know, my basic thesis is you leave the campsite better off than you find the campsite. And I felt as if I'd gotten a lot of incredibly positive luck in my life and that I was gonna try to make sure before you know, I uh, died that I would try to make it even and that other people got the same chances that I got and that it was more just and more evenly distributed. And you know, that's, you know, I don't view that as some great thing. I think that that's, I also feel very lucky that I get an opportunity to work on that. That's what I like to work on, that's what I care about. I wanna have a meaningful life. And I view the chance to work on that as like this incredible gift that I get that is a luxury. You know, I'm lucky enough to be able to take care of the basics of life and if I get a chance to do the things that I care the most about, what a great luxury that is. And you know, I feel incredibly blessed. So in October of 2017, nine months, barely, <laughs> into the president's, uh, after taking the oath of office, um, you launched an organization called Need to Impeach. Yep. Now, you've been very active, and Next Gen Climate had been, um, was a well-respected grassroots uh, organizing group, but you launched this new organization, Need to Impeach, Need to Impeach nine months after the president entered office. Why at that moment? And the guy, some would argue, barely could figure out where the bathrooms were in the White House at that point. He had just started. <laughs> had he already done enough damage in October of 2017 that you it thought there was a need to impeach? So let's talk about two things. What need to impeach is and why need to impeach? You're asking why need to impeach. So I'll answer that question, but I want to talk about what we were doing. Uh, maybe I'll start with that. Look, need to impeach is a petition drive. We are a grassroots organization. Need to impeach is an attempt to organize the voice of Americans, to let American broadly, we have seven point, I hope you guys will please sign up if you haven't. We have 7.7 .7 million people who've signed up. We add about 10,000 people a day. It's an attempt to bring the American people into the conversation, to not let it be dominated by people who are in Congress, inside Washington, in the elites, but to have the information and the decision much more broadly made and much more broadly shared. In October of 2017, the two things that we've talked about the most were already true. We knew that the president was corrupt. We knew that he hadn't he hadn't disposed of his businesses. He hadn't separated himself from his businesses. He was taking money on a daily basis from foreign governments and from people who wanted to suborn his, uh, his decision making. And we also knew at that point that he had been involved in obstruction of justice by firing the head of the FBI and by r routinely trying to prevent his administration and his behavior from being examined. And, and we said, this is true now. This is a standard that is being set. It is clear that that standard will continue and that there will be more information that will make us seem 
you know, that everything we're saying is going to continue and get worse. And I would say the exact same thing today. That in fact, what we saw then is true today. It was true before we started. It's been true since between then and now, and it continues to be true on a daily basis. And we felt as if we, the American values and the American norms and the American laws either were going to be enforced or we were going to have a different democracy. And that democracy was going to be one where people, the president was above the law. And I can understand, look, if you think about, when I think about the United States right now, there is a gigantic question about justice, if people are treated equally. I mean, if you guys have been reading about this scandal with the colleges, college admissions, people paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to secure phony admissions for their kids. There is a real question in the United States whether people are, hand, are dealt with even-handedly. And one of the big questions with this president is, is he above the law? Is he allowed with impunity to break the law, to break his oath to the Constitution, to put Americans at risk? And our attitude is no. That, you know, we're, we strongly believe that what we're doing is right, that America has got to stand up for the right, and if you don't do it under pressure because it is difficult or the person is powerful or rich, that you have decided, you've set a precedent, and that precedent is gonna be observed in the future, and you have now a new way of relating to each other. So we felt that was all true in October 2017. We thought it was true between then and now. Very true today. So I want to talk about both the case for impeachment, and then I want to talk a little bit about the politics of this um, as an institute of politics and public service. Mm -hmm. um, so let's start with the case. Because agree with you or not, I think your organization has articulated a clear argument. Right? There are a lot of people who say they're for impeachment, and it's because they just don't like the president. And there are a lot of people who say they're against impeachment, and that's because they love the president. You guys at least set out, and you began to touch on it, but you set out sort of 10 arguments. And some of them, I think, uh, some people would agree with. Some of them, the same person might disagree with. But I want to go through them real quick. Um, and ask you a couple questions about them. So, so can I put the, so it's please. true. On our website, there are 10 we, there, we got 54 legal scholars. I'm not a lawyer. We got 54 legal scholars to lay out grounds for impeachment, and we took what they said and put them on our lawsuit, on, on our website, excuse me. If people ask me about impeachment, if they've asked me about impeachment in the last, since October 20, 2017, I always say the same things, which is the two things that strike me personally in this, Mo, where I say, this seems very clear to me, are basic corruption and obstruction of justice. And I've said, look, from my standpoint, there's information in the public sector, in public reporting that everybody knows that shows this is something that is occurring. And so go th I want you yeah. to go through the 10. I'm not yeah. upset and, about that, and, but I'm just saying and again, that's the context and the frame that we've had. This is a simple question. And for the purposes of this conversation, I would ask everyone to think about the context with one more piece of data, and that is the constitutional threshold for impeachment, which right. is high crimes and misdemeanors, right? Uh, that if a pre if they, that the person may be convicted of an impeachable events if they're found guilty of high crimes or misdemeanors. Um, and so the first uh, uh, impeachable offense is obstruction of justice. Mm -hmm. and that's a case that has been well discussed over the, ever since Jim Comey's Firing. Firing. Um, and so one, talk about that real briefly, but then two, did the events of this past weekend and the bar letter complicate the argument on that? So I'm sure you guys have seen that, you know, obviously Attorney General Barr gave his version of the Mueller report, which included questions about obstruction of justice. Attorney General Barr also someone who said the Mueller investigation was something they thought was overreaching and improper. And that's why he's the attorney general. So to a very large extent, what, if, if, if you care about the Mueller report, then we would very much like to see the Mueller report and the facts about obstruction of justice. 
because for over a year we've said, look, this case is not about the Mueller report. This is really overwhelmingly about corruption and obstruction, and we look forward to seeing the Mueller report. We look forward to seeing the information in the Mueller report, but we don't need the Mueller report because we've seen stuff on these topics in the public domain that are clear. So I, what I would say, does it, is it more complicated? Obviously, we've gotten the administration's take on this. What we haven't gotten is the Mueller report. The American people have not gotten the information. What we believe in is letting the American people, you guys, your families, people like you across America, get the facts and we make up our minds. That's what we care about. We're, we're a grassroots organization who believe what we're missing is the, the involvement and the information of the American people. And so when we look at, when we say we're waiting for the Mueller report, we want to be allowed to see it and we don't want it curated by the Attorney General and we don't want it curated by Fox News we want Americans to get the facts. But to be clear, you guys were taking the stand, and you personally have taken the stand, and you said it earlier tonight, that you believe the president was guilty of obstruction of justice, and you believe that was clear ever since that day that he fired Jim Cohen. I do. Yeah. Okay. And I think that if you watch his behavior, he, he has intentionally tried to frustrate this investigation. He has tried to do whatever he can to stay above the law. Second impeachable offense is violating the Emoluments Clause of the U.S. Constitution. So I know you guys go to Georgetown, so that means you got double eight hundreds on your SATs or triple eight hundreds. <laughs> so I know you got emoluments, which was question 23. Um, so, you know, I think that's just a fancy word. It's just bribery. You're not allowed to take a bribe from a foreign country when you're president of the United States, and that's in the Constitution. By the way, it's not against the law to take bribes, to take payments. There's no law against emoluments. But in the Constitution, it's specifically said you can't take a single payment. And obviously, since the president owns a bunch of real estate, if you drive around, I believe it's called Washington, D.C., you'll see the Trump Hotel, and you'll realize that people stay at the Trump Hotel to try and buy favors from the president of the United States and that the Saudis have three floors rented at the Trump Tower. And it's not a fluke. You know, if you look at most of the world, I mean, let me ask you guys a question. How many of you guys are not American citizens? I know this is. So if you look around the world, and I've invested around the world for decades, a lot of the world accepts bribery. It's just a standard operating procedure in a lot of the world. If the President of the United States puts up a sign over the White House that says, for sale, a lot of people around the world say, how much? They're not wondering. If he's for sale, they're in. And so, in the Emoluments Clause, do I believe that the President knows that he's taking money from foreign governments? Yes. Do they intentionally do, stay at his stuff, rent his stuff, and do that? Absolutely. Okay. I, sorry. It is, that one seems, I don't know how, much, how many times you guys have gotten hundreds of thousands of dollars from people, but I tend to believe it changes people's attitudes. Number three, conspiring with others to commit crimes against the United States and attempting to conceal those violations. And amongst that, you specifically, or the group specifically cites, they tried to cover up his campaign's contacts with the Russian national. Um, is that collusion? Listen, <laughs> I'm not sure I can define collusion. I think that what we've seen is, and, I, and I'll give you an example, did the president lie about his relationship with Russia prior to being president? For sure. I mean, he obviously was trying to build a tower, a Trump Tower in Moscow. He thought he would make a couple hundred million bucks from it. He claimed that wasn't true, and I think a lot of the subsequent cover-up and the attempt to stifle this investigation has been to obstruct justice has been around the fact that he had continuing contacts in an attempt to build a tower in Russia. So your arguing is that he lied to us about this? 
No, it's, it's not, not just, a, it's not, not a, that's not what I said. What okay. I said is including all the obstruction and the, the idea of his working with Michael Cohen yeah. to continue to lie about. Yeah, because I, because that I think is a line that there's some out there that look to blur, right? I mean, even Rudy Giuliani, the president's attorney, has been known to say something along the lines of, "So he lied. He lied about an affair. He didn't. You know, he doesn't lying to the American people isn't a criminal offense, and it certainly doesn't rise to the level of high crimes, high crimes and misdemeanors." But you're saying it's more than just the lying. Look, I think if you look, we, to be fair, what we're asking for is public hearings. We've had one day of public hearings, which was Michael Cohen testifying to the House Oversight Committee, which I don't know if you guys watched, but I think 16 million Americans watched. During that one day of testimony from one guy, it became clear that Mr. Trump, as part of his cover-up of the affair with um, a porn actress, while he was in the presidency, apparently committed a felony in terms of the way he covered it up and the, the payment to her while he was president, which was an illegal campaign contribution. And in addition, Mr. Cohen lied, not just lied, which as you point out, is not a crime, but this is not a criminal question. This is a political question and high crimes and misdemeanors it actually doesn't refer to crimes. This is a political question about whether he has broken his oath to the Constitution and the American people. But in this case, Mr. Cohen is going to jail for lying about what was going on during the campaign. And Mr. Trump's lawyers, he said, in fact, read his testimony and edited it. And they said, did Mr. Trump tell you what to do? And he said, no, I knew that my job was to lie for Mr. Trump because that's what I did. So in that case, is it just a question? This is not a criminal inquiry. Getting thrown out as president of the United States is not whether you have parking right. tickets. It is a question of whether you have broken your faith with the American people and your oath under the Constitution. I and that is a question of, are you putting the American people first? Are you doing your job in terms of representing them faithfully and only them? That's actually what high crimes and misdemeanors mean. That is an 18th century phrase that means something different if you go back to the Constitution than if you sit in 2019 and think about, there are lots of words in 1792 that sound different 230 years later. But I think it's an important point that a lot of people miss, and that is impeachment really is not a legal thing. It, is, it is a political tool. It is a political process. If, if you have an, a corrupt president, the, t the means to get rid of him or her is impeachment, and that's what the, fr the framers gave us. And it wasn't, you know, there are things that are illegal that you shouldn't get impeached for, and there are things that are illegal that you should get impeached for, as an example. And, and so, if, for example, if the president decided to move to Monaco and take up residence there and gamble every day, he should be impeached. It's not a crime. So, I'm, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through all 10, but there's a couple more I just wanna focus on before we move to the politics of this. Um, one of them is, that I find really interesting is engaging in conduct that grossly endangers the peace and security of the United States, that he's unfit to fulfill his duties as commander in chief, he's not at the capacity to make informed decisions. Uh, and an example is his tweets and public statements that taunt and threaten the North Korean regime. So and, can, I, can I address yeah. this one? So I didn't write that, but <laughs> I wanna talk about this because this is actually something I take really seriously. Number one job of the President of the United States, Commander in Chief. I mean, whether you're, whoever you are, your job is to keep Americans safe. So let's talk about what safety actually looks like in the 21st century. I think a lot of people tend to think about safety in terms of the kind of armed conflicts that we had in the 20th century, or maybe the armed conflicts that we had in the 19th century. This is the 21st century. I'm going to give you two examples where I feel he has very seriously fallen down on his job as commander in chief. One, electronic attack on our election in 2016 by the Russians. Forget 
anything about collusion or all that stuff, we'll get the information from the Mueller report at some point, I hope. But what we do know is the entire defense establishment and the entire intelligence community feels strongly and as evidence that the Russians hacked our election. I think something like 30 Russians or something have been indicted on it. And it was actually the equivalent, the, the follow on to the KGB who did it. So this is, that's what warfare looks like in the 21st century, electronic warfare by a hostile government to attack our democracy. The president decided he believed the Russians. He believed Vladimir Putin. They didn't do it. That to me was an absolute abdication of his job as commander in chief to make us safe and to make our country safe. Secondly, if you were to ask me, the safety of Americans, what do I think is probably the highest probability threat to American safe? I would say climate. That if you look at the projections of the costs in health and safety to Americans across the country over the next 15 to 20 years, I'd say by far the highest threat to people's safety and to people's health and to the economic security of the United States is climate. We are the only country in the world, specifically because of this president, who is not in the Paris Accord. Syria is in the Paris Accord. We are the only country in the world. He is working as hard as he can to try and make sure that we accelerate climate change. And if you ask me, that is not a position that has any if you think about safety and health of the American people, the commander in chief putting us at risk for a political purpose, he believes it's a great political outcome for him, that in fact, fossil fuel companies are gigantic supporters of his party. They give millions of dollars. They are the largest industry in the history of the world. But the commander in chief has decided that the safety of Americans comes second to his political interests. Sorry, that's not impeachable. So, so here's the question, right? And, and look, there's more to the 10. I encourage you all to go to the website, which is needtoimpeach.com. Needtoimpeach.com. And you can read the rest of them. But this is a good transition. This is a good segue to the political argument. Mm -hmm. Because there are those who would argue, and everyone here knows I'm a Democrat. I work at the DNC under the Obama administration. But there are people out there that would argue that the Obama administration, that would make the same argument about President Obama um, falling down on the job as commander in chief when he did the Iran deal, or President Bush on the Iraq war, or Bill Clinton for allowing North Korea to get nukes in the first place. And so my argument is where do you draw the line between just a, an, uh, an honest, a grave, policy honest policy difference that may have grave consequences, but an honest policy difference and a violation of the commander in chief test. So, Mo, that's a great question. And let me say this. When people ask me what I believe are the straightforward answers for impeachment, I say corruption and obstruction of justice because they are clear. It's not a policy issue. Taking money from a foreign country is not a policy issue. It's a bribe. Obstructing justice is not a policy issue. It's obstructing justice and, and trying to be above the law. You, people wrote 10 things and you're asking me, what do I think? Do I, I agree with you that when you're fighting people on policy, it's much murkier, which is why I don't talk about it. I was just yeah. answering your question. Yeah, sure. If you ask me about his job as commander in chief, I think the first one is not a policy question, if you'll excuse my saying so. I believe that the entire defense establishment said we have had an electronic warfare prosecuted against us by a hostile foreign power, and he decided to take their side. So that one, I'm, I'm sorry, doesn't seem like a policy question. And maybe I'm a little bit of a bug about climate because I, keep, I look at the science all the time, and I'm obsessed with the idea that we need to preserve God's planet for the next generation. So I, I, am, I will plead guilty to caring a great deal about that and having contempt for people who don't. <laughs> and so I'm going to come back to this point. But in order to come back to this point, I want to deviate from it for a second. So a couple of weeks ago now, two weeks ago, Speaker Pelosi, uh, maybe, maybe about a week ago, said that she was not a supporter of impeachment at this point. This was before 
Mueller submitted his report. She essentially said, um, you know, if, if we get to the point where it is something that we need to do, we will entertain it. But at this point, it is not something that we need to do. I'm paraphrasing because it's too divisive. You came out pretty strongly against. Well, that is her exactly saying. what she said, Mo. Okay. Well, then, then why don't you tell us what you re what you responded to? What she said was, "I'm not for impeachment. I don't think he's worth it, and we're not for impeachment until it's a bipartisan, unless it's a bipartisan effort. If something happens that is significant enough to make it a bipartisan effort, then we'd be open to it. But otherwise, I think it's too divisive. So I think that's a." Fair summary. Okay, so if to take that argument one step further, right? In follow-up interviews, I believe she said something along the lines of, "Look, and, and there are other people who have made this argument, whether or not she did, that impeachment, having some of the conversations you're talking about, holding hearings on whether or not the president has been derelict it, because he took Russia's side on the question of." of um, Russian interference, right? That's a legitimate thing. But once you start painting it within the framework of impeachment, doesn't that just bring out our most base tribal instincts? And even people who might be open to an anti-Trump argument might say, now you're going too far. And that's why if you ask me what we should actually have, have hearings about, I would say corruption and obstruction of uh -huh. justice. Uh -huh. And the crimes that we know he committed as part of his association and relationship with Michael Cohen. So, you know, I, I agree with you. Yeah. There are 10 things on our website, but if you ask yeah. me what the hearings but, should be, I would say that. But even and, beyond, let's, let's keep it focused on, on those things, mm -hmm. right? Is there a difference? Do you think, again, in the politics of this, holding a hearing on each of these, each of these items versus actually holding impeachment hearings, actually drafting articles of impeachment. You have to have the hearings first. So You can't do the second without doing the first. What we've been saying is, look, we're a grassroots organization. We want public hearings like the Cohen hearings, so hearing so that Americans can get the information. So think for one second, and I don't know what people at Georgetown thought about this, but there have been two public hearings in the last year of the type that I'm describing. One was the Brett Kavanaugh hearing. People were absolutely engaged and learned something about what's going on in our country from that hearing. The other was the Michael Cohen hearing. People learned something about what's going in our country and who the people are that we're talking about. So when we look at this, we say, <clears throat> the only way that this can happen is if the American people want it to happen. And the only reason, way that the American people can have the information to make up their minds is if we have a series of public hearings so they can see who these guys are, see what they've done, see what they sound like. Because from our standpoint, this is not about convincing people in Congress. We believe, we're a grassroots organization. We, we're trying to get power back to the people away from the elites. And so our attitude is, we want to empower the voice of Americans, and we want Americans, whether they're Republicans or Democrats or Independents, to get the direct information about who, what's been going on. I think what's been going on is absolutely wrong. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not equivocal about it. I think what he's done is to, is to absolutely attack the rule of law at its essence by his behavior. And I think Americans, but I put it to the American people, put it in front of, 320 million Americans, let them watch and see who these people are and what they've done. And see, you know, what are our values? That's what happened in Watergate. Everybody watched it on TV. A whole lot of facts came out that nobody knew. Americans across the board, across the country. And it actually was a great experience for us all. We all got to see the same people saying the same things. And we, we, people disagreed on what Brett Kavanaugh was like. Some people thought he was terrific. Some people thought he was anathema. But we had the same experience of hearing somebody say what he thought and hear what other people said about what he'd done. And that's what we're talking about doing. So there was a poll that came out earlier this month. I'm sure you're familiar with it. I think it was a CNN poll that showed that um, uh, a decline in support 
for uh, impeachment, down from 43 percent in December to 36 percent now. The biggest drop was amongst self-identified Democrats, who back in December, 80 percent of Democrats supported the idea of impeaching the president, and that's down now to 68 percent. The, the only subgroup where the decline was larger than among Democrats was amongst college-educated voters. Um, and so my question- You can't trust those people who have college education. Yeah, well, college just screws you That's up for worst. life. I mean, take that lesson from here. Um, but the question is, you know, why? Why is there people moving in the opposite direction, even though you guys have been out there pretty aggressively and have had some tremendous success on the organizing front. I mean, 10,000 new signups a day, is, that's nothing to sneeze at. Um, why is the trajectory then, at least in the public polling, moving in the opposite direction? <laughs> I mean, do you think it has anything to do with the Democratic leadership saying they're not for impeachment? So that's what you would argue. You would argue that you're just not getting support Look, from- for this, for, uh, for Americans to want to do this, they have to have public hearings. Look, we, one of the things that is not true, but which I wish were true and which we've asked for, is the House Ways and Means Committee has a right to ask for any American citizen's tax returns, including the president's. Michael Cohen said that the president's tax returns include criminality, all they have to, and if you ask for them, you will see it clearly. We have not asked for the tax returns. We, you know, there is a very clear question here where we do not control hearings in the House of Representatives. I, I will mention that to you guys. We cannot request the tax returns. All we can do is try and get American <coughs> citizens to, to add their voices. We got 92,000 people to send a message to the House the head of the House Ways Commit and Means Committee, asking him to ask for the tax returns. But the, what, what's going on is clearly, and it happened today in spades, the congressional leadership doesn't want to have public hearings, does not want to bring this evidence in front of the American people, does not want to have this discussion. And if you, and it's deeper than that, we have a very different idea, look, these are people who we agree with on values, agree with on outcomes. I'm gonna say this quickly because you wanna to turn to questions. But if you think about what's going on, what's really going on is a very different question than the one that's happening overtly. We think that the reason that the country flipped in 2018 was because of turnout. We believe that the turnout nationwide between the last midterm elections and 2018 went from 37% to 57%. Right, because the counter argument, just to, right, the counter argument that anti-impeachment Democrats make is the candidates, the races where we flipped seats, those candidates weren't talking impeachment. They were talking health care. They were talking other issues. So it, that's exactly the argument. And we're saying, no, what happened in 2018 was Democrats, young people, the people, we're the largest youth organizers in the country by far. In the places where we are organized, people between 18 and 29, their turnout in 2014, the last midterm, was 18%. In 2018, it was 41%. The split between D's and R's was 44%, 72, 28. So when you ask us what happened in 2018, we say the overall turnout went up by 60%, that Democrats nationwide won by 9%, the so-called rising American electorate turned out completely differently than they did in 2014. And that was not because of healthcare, it was because of the threat to healthcare. It was not because of climate, it was because the threat to all environmental concerns. So that actually this was very much about Mr. Trump and the threat that he poses to Americans. Actually Republicans turned out really, really high in the 2018 midterms. It's just that Democrats turned out much, much higher than they ever have historical highs after historical lows. So we have a very different yeah. impression about what happened in 2018. And so for us, telling the truth to the American people, candidly, is the, that's what we believe in, is being straight on the most important issues. And so we don't believe in trying to sweep it under the rug the most important things. We believe in being candid 
that we believe that's what gets people involved, that that's what gets people to believe, and that that's what gets people to turn out so that we can actually have the outcomes that we actually all want. All right, let's stop my hack democratic establishment questions and get to the good <laughs> questions now. I thought you'd like that. Uh, get to the questions, no, no. the good questions. Um, so tell us who you are, where you come from, what you're studying, and then ask your question briefly. Hey there, thank you for coming to speak. My name is Brady Marsden, freshman in the School of Foreign Service. So, where are you from? New York City. So on what we were just discussing, and how a lot of Democrats did run and went on policies, a lot of Republicans also ran on policies. The hearings that you're proposing would take a lot of time and energy from the members and, and from political advocates on both sides. Do you think that that time and energy is justifiably spent on these hearings over issues like health care, border security, international security? And so, if so, why? Thank you. Well, let me say that I, we've actually been talking to some people in Congress over the last two days. And one of the things that they've said to us is, you know, I mean, I think the cliche at this point is we can walk and chew gum. They have more than enough time to do both. That it isn't really a question about the bandwidth in the Congress of the United States. It's much more about the bandwidth in terms of the pundits on TV at night. And so, you know, I think the ability to do this is something they can do both. But I think that they're worried about timing. Now, let me say one other thing. Look, <laughs> I'm a straight up progressive. I understand what's going on. I am also was an investor for 35 years. I can talk for a long time about healthcare and what's going on in the United States. And I think that's an incredibly important question. But let me tell you something that's not going to happen in the next two years. Adjustments to healthcare in the United States. I mean, let's be candid. The, the Senate is still controlled by Republicans. The president is going to be a Republican. And they have absolutely no interest in improving the Affordable Care Act. So you're right. We could talk about health care till we're blue in the face, and I'm happy to do it. But if you think there's going to be legislation between now and 2020, I would argue you're wrong. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Brian Taylor. I'm a freshman in the college, and uh, I'm from New Jersey. Um, by your definition of um, bribery, bribery, you explained that by um, private entities and other governments funneling money toward Trump business interests would uh, count, therefore, as bribery. Would you consider uh, donations by governments, such as by the government of like Haiti and Russia, to the Clinton Foundation while Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, a <laughs> conflict of interest or bribery of any sort? Well, I th here's what I would say as a distinction. That didn't go into her pocket. The, I mean, I, kn I don't know that much about the Clinton Foundation, and obviously there have been a lot of charges. But the Clinton Foundation, by definition, legally, was a foundation. So whatever money went into the Clinton Foundation, as far as I know, was going to try and promote programs around the world, for, to, mostly about health and, as I understand it, agriculture. So do I think that that went directly into her pocket? I know it didn't. I think the difference is this really is going directly into Mr. Trump's pocket. And so I think that. You know, that is, I, I understand your point, but I think that's a pretty stark dividing line, honestly. If I may ask you a question. Sure. You, um, you said that the focus on the money from the Trump Foundation was to help give money to the Trump I understand your point. I believe the Trump Foundation was closed because it did not follow the law. And in fact, it wasn't a real foundation. It was a subterfuge for, to, it, to uh, aid Mr. Trump's businesses. So actually, it was closed under the order of the US attorney in New York State. So I would not see the Trump Foundation as being a legitimate organization. And in fact, they closed it. All right, let's move on to another question. Hi, my name is Ryan. I'm in the college studying government and biology, and I'm from Westchester, New York. Um, I know some of this has been stated already, but um, the Mueller report far quotes Mueller saying that it's inconclusive on instruction of justice that there's no collusion. Even if the House impeached Trump, the Senate clearly right now wouldn't convict him. Do you think that this argument towards impeachment just fuels the fire for Trump to claim that the opposition is making baseless impeachment claims against him <laughs> and aid him in winning back the White House in 2020? And do you think that energy would be better spent towards electing a Democratic candidate 
in 2020, given that even if he was impeached, Mike Pence would be the president? So that's a couple different questions, okay. but I'll try and answer them. Look, in people asked me that question in 2018, right? They said, you know, why are you, why are you spending all this time in impeachment? Isn't it more important to flip the house? Which was the big question in 2018. And we said, oh, don't worry. We are all in on flipping the house. And so in fact, we were the largest youth voter mobilization effort in American history in 2018, grassroots. We hit 10 million doors with union allies to talk to underrepresented communities about their issues to make sure that they were, were more likely to vote. And our list, which at that point was 6.2 million people, which is now 7.7 .7 million people, voted in an 80% rate. People on the list sent 1.6 million postcards to each other asking people in swing districts to vote. So when you ask me, do you think I should be more focused on electing progressives, my answer would be, actually, there's no one in the United States who is more focused on electing progressives. And so to me, the question is, are we, we, are, we are grassroots people, but we also, look, I have only two rules about politics. Tell the truth, put the American people first. As far as I'm concerned, if you do those two things, we can disagree on everything, I have no problems. What we're dealing with here is something completely different. We have, as far as I'm concerned, this is corruption. It is people who are not telling the truth and not putting the American people first. That, that it's actually an attack on the system itself. If we set a president that the pre, a precedent, wow, it's a tongue twister. If we set a precedent that the president is above the law, I promise you that's a precedent that everybody will follow in the future. If the president can do all this stuff, you can, I can see it on the Democratic side. People are saying, if he can do that, we have to do that. I promise. That's Democrats who, who say what he's doing is terrible. But they're saying, if he's going to do it, we are definitely going to do it. And I'll give you one last example. You know, in the Constitution, it says that if you're going to declare war, you need a, constitution, you need the, a congressional approval. First person who didn't get it was Harry Truman, right, in Korea. Didn't get congressional approval for the Korean conflict. Every president since then has done some form of foreign conflict, armed conflict, without congressional approval. So what we're establishing here is what does our country stand for? What are the rules for the chief executive? And if we decide there are no rules, just be clear, that's forever. To pick up on the on the other part of his question, though, because it's it's an interesting one, I thought. The look, my side gig. We were talking about this earlier. My side gig is as a Fox News contributor. There's a lot of folks hanging out in the green room over at Fox News who are maybe skeptical about the president. Republicans who don't necessarily love him, but when the issue of impeachment comes up, they get all fired up. Now, in 2018, that didn't happen, right? They did. They all came out. But we also saw that the president's support does not always transfer to other, other Republican candidates. With him on the ballot, do you have political concern that this, that this approach might actually give him the, the ammunition to fire his base up even more and say, see, they're coming to get us? Okay, let me say this. Am I worried that Mr. Trump is going to fire up his base even more? Can you fire up his base even more than he does? I mean, this is a guy who lives to fire up his base. And he's very good at it. And you know, you look, that's what he does. That's why he declared a state of emergency so he could take money from the budget that Congress wouldn't give him to build a wall. So am I worried that the president is actually a very effective, um, communicator who lives to divide us and fire up his base. I know that. Yeah. Do I think this is going to be an excuse for him? I think that this is something that has a, a, t a clock ticking in terms of timing. This is something that after a while is, cannot go forward. Do I think that he is going to claim that he is a victim? He always claims he's a yeah. victim. He's one of the world's greatest victims in his own mind. Yeah. All right, we've got time for one more from the audience. No, we have, we have, two. We have one more, okay. Hi, um, my name is Elliot. I'm a first year in the School of Foreign Service. Um, Where are you from? I'm half French, half American. 
Um, and my question was, do you think that the messaging of your campaign as need to impeach because of 10 offenses that some seem to be convoluted or uh, at least not fully clear um, is, um, is, 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 is being like hurtful to your campaign rather than focusing on um, the needs for a hearing and putting um, the, uh, the information in front of the American people on two specific issues, corruption and obstruction, uh, which I think a lot more people would, would probably agree on transparency and, and acro across the board, across political parties. And so do you think that you would be ready to like shift the way the website the way reads. the way you the website works and the way your campaign well, is Well, you know, this is what I say all the time anyway. So, no, believe it or not. But if you want to yell at those guys, I would, <laughs> I would suggest you do so immediately. I think, you know, from my standpoint, I think it, that actually what our message is is much more clear, at least when I, you know, espouse it, it's what I say. And so, yeah, I think for, from my standpoint, there's something going on here about, as there is in many issues, which is, are the American people, you know, the old, I don't know if you guys are too young to, there was a Jack Nicholson movie where he goes, the truth, you can't handle the truth. And I think that's the attitude for a lot of people with the American people. The truth, you guys can't handle the truth. And our attitude is, no, the American people can handle the truth. And I'm not in any way disrespectful of Republican voters. My attitude is I want everybody in America to see this without it being processed by some news organization. And I believe that we can handle the truth. And actually when I think about what's going on in the United States, to me the biggest political fact of the United States is that pr almost four out of five Americans think the political system does not work for them. Believe the system has been hacked believe that basically corporate interests have taken over and that actually that's who's being served, not them. That is actually what Trump voters think. That is what Bernie voters think. It's what four out of five Americans think, is that this system is not responding to them. So when we push for truth, when we run propositions, which is direct democracy, when we try to go to the parts of America that aren't participating adequately in elections, we're trying, one of the things we deeply believe in is the truth. Let's get the truth to the American people because we trust people. The more dis disparate, the larger, the better. That's gonna be our best decision maker. So actually, you know, I, I do think we could do a better job of communicating, you know, always, but really what we're pushing for is what we would think of as broad-based democracy that is fairly representative. I mean, you guys are probably in the single most underrepresented group in the United States of America, which is young people. Young people vote at half the rate of everybody else. And believe me, it is reflected in how you're treated by elected officials. So we've got time for one final question. And you just started to touch on it in your last answer, so I'm gonna ask you to expand on it a little bit more. I mean, the, the conventional wisdom inside this town is that impeachment would be incredibly divisive at a time when we are already incredibly divided. <laughs> but you, I overheard you talking earlier about how you were just down in South Carolina, not exactly a purple state. Deep red. Right, talking about this issue and... I love I, red states. Right, I guess my question is, make your case to the red states. How does, how how can we actually use this as a tool? Can we use this as a tool to actually bring Americans together as opposed to pulling us further apart? Well, let me say this. I, I'm gonna take a step back even from that question. Yeah. Look, it's 2019. We are incredibly divided. I, I would, I think statistically we're the most divided since like 1859, which didn't work out all that well. In my mind, what America is missing is a positive vision for what America stands for. And I think that we have had several of them. I think the last actual vision for what America is about, and it's a vision that I disagree with and I believe that it's intellectually bankrupt at this point, was the Reagan Revolution. A different way of thinking about the relationship with the public sector, with taxes, 
with the private sector, with unions, with all, the whole vision of what makes America prosperous and just. And I think we're at a point where that vision has run its course and we absolutely are dying to go back to a question of what we stand for and, and who we are and what we're trying to accomplish together. And so I look at this when I think, I think it's impossible to look at impeachment where I believe what we're standing up for is basic American values about justice and equality. That the president's not above the law. That everybody gets treated fairly. You don't get $200,000, you can get into Georgetown as part of the women's sailing team. That it's, we're supposed to be a much more equal and just society than that. And the flip side of insisting that our values and our norms and our laws matter is talking about what we're trying to create together and how we relate to each other in the government. And I think that it's two sides of the same coin. So when I look at 2019, I look at it as we should be going back to what are our actual values, what is a positive vision of who we are, and aren't we gonna insist that people take our system and our values seriously and behave well? Aren't we gonna insist on it? And certainly aren't we gonna insist that the richest, most powerful, most lucky people in fact, treat the system as something that has given them so much that they will play by the rules completely and there will be no cheating. And that's the question I believe we're asking. This is a question about values, about American values, and that's why I want public hearings. Let Americans ask themselves what they, what they believe, regardless of pardon. That's, what we, that's why we do grassroots, that's what we believe in, and that's what we think America's missing. Um, our mission as an institute is to engage more young people in the process and the mission of this university is to instill in us all this a sense that we are all here as men and women for others. Uh, Tom, I um, share a lot of your values. I don't agree or follow, agree with all of how you're approaching it, but I so appreciate and respect you for doing what you're doing and putting it all out on the field through your philanthropy through your activism, through your youth engagement in order to fight for those values that we share, even if we don't always agree on the tactics to fight for those shared values. And so thank you for doing it. Thank you for coming here to talk. Thank to you guys. Today. Thank you, Mo, for being so much. Nice.